So does anyone have any questions yet? <laughs> cool shirt. <laughs> so this shirt is uh, imported from Holland and now brought back to its home. So it's very happy to be back here. Uh, my sister-in-law lives in The Hague, got it for me, and brought it to me in Israel. And um, I brought it from their home, obviously, and I've been wearing it ever since. And um, my last name is Lapidus, so we do call ourselves the Lapidus family, and we all wear lots of leopard. As this is a very green um, screen, but I think it will lighten up. And that's a picture of um, my wife there, who I was talking about. It's very photogenic. And, and me, I know I have a beard in the picture, but that's, that's me. And you'll see some of me like that, and some of me not like that. So um, we're called Lovid. Um, this is a piece that we made as a way of kind of um, sending ourselves overseas, over to Europe, without having to come here. So we scanned ourselves with a hand scanner. Um, wearing these, these outfits um, and sent the files and they assembled these uh, cardboard avatars of us with them. Um, so, but what it's showing is the video where, and I have a few more slides of it. These are 14 LCD screens that we used to perform with. Um, this shot shows some of our old equipment. We used to use more kind of bent stuff and sort of off the shelf kind of commercial electronics and you know make modifications, basically focus on the patch. Um, and we were really trying to break the video sync, the information that determines that video is video with that. Um, we were also very interested in the wires. You can see all the sort of hundreds of feet, you know, about 100 meters of cable um, that, that is behind us that's carrying the sort of the electricity and the signal that these monitors need to function, and obviously from our signal. This can be played live or as an installation um, where it can play a recorded thing. And in this installation version, they hang kind of where we are. Um, as if we've sort of evaporated, the term we like to use is annihilated, um, into this sort of um, video signal, and we leave these puddles behind us on the floor there. Um, but we noticed one problem working between performance and installation was that um, when we were performing with it, people would see us and they would see our bodies interacting with the electronics, which was very important for us, 
but as an installation, um, they could see all the details that they couldn't see in the live setting. Like here, I'm, you know, if I were performing now, you would see me, but I'm kind of like a little bit far away from you, right? But in an installation, you can walk up and see all the details. Um, but on the same time, then I'm not in it, so you don't see my body interacting with it. And uh, this piece, the details are very important because they're all video stills of ours. Just as the puddles on the floor are video stills, this protective sportswear, so it's 14 LCD screens that are embedded in um, protective sportswear, so helmets, elbow pads, knee pads, and wrist guards. So kind of a little bit, you know, we want to get kind of intimate with the technology, but it is a little bit scary and kind of hard and sharp, and it might poke your electric you or something. So um, we wanted some protection from that. And, uh, but we wanted people to be able to experience this, so we did a series of these photos where you can kind of get some of the details of the close-up of seeing the fabric, which is the video stills, and seeing our bodies with it. Um, so from sort of that stage, we moved on to wanting to develop our own instruments, because we were most interested always in when the sync signal, the video sort of termination signal, was most broken, like right before the screen would kind of cut to blue. We figured out ways to stabilize that with mixers and sort of uh, time-based correctors, things like that. But we really liked that moment when it was just about as broken as it could be and still be recognized as video. So we wanted a way to be able to sort of have a little bit more control of that. And so we thought the best way was to make our own sink. Um, so that's what this instrument does. This is a three meter long table that has 28 um, analog modules in it that um, basically make video and sound. It's called the sync harmonica. It's modeled after a glass harp. Um, or a glass harmonica, which is where you have these wine glasses and you run your finger around the surface of them in order to uh, play it and get different tones depending how much water you have in it relative to glass. Um, so they're circular and they're also similar to the way we were, you know, for the video where we printed the video stills onto fabric and on the floor there was the paper prints. Um, on these we've actually taken a laser cutter. We made this at a place called iBeam in New York with a laser cutter and we laser etched on the surface video stills as well as sort of some other um, information that's useful for us. Uh, in terms of sort of knowing what the modules do. Um, we were very interested, again, in the wires, in the wireful element of it. We call it wireful rather than wireless in sort of exposing the device and the technology and kind of letting people experience that. Um, but we did want it to be somewhat protected, so it's in this clear plexi, so you can kind of see the wires, you can see the modules, but at the same time, it's a little bit shielded. Um, now, you saw that initial picture where it looks very kind of, um, kind of minimal and kind of clean. It has just these white things. You almost can't see the white on white edges anyway from a distance. Um, and then it's on this gray table. It's kind of like a minimal thing. But once it gets wired up, it gets a lot more wireful than just inside the modules. And you start to see the wires, and it becomes a very different look. And you can see kind of more what it looks like when we're actually playing the instrument there. Uh, this is from performance we were doing at uh, Roulette. And there's one still, and then there's us performing, obviously. So, um, so from there, we went on, and we wanted to build sort of other kinds of immersive environments in terms of the installations. So we used sort of similar modules and similar design for the synthesizer to start making these environments. Uh, this was one we did at a festival called Evolution in Leeds. And it's a room-sized uh, cardboard inside-out analog audio video synthesizer. So all the modules are on the outside of you. And you go inside it to play. It can fit about five or six people in there at a time. And there are some speakers inside. And there's a projector outside. And uh, it's modeled after four-dimensional mathematics. That's why it's called a GLOM. A GLOM is like a 4D sphere. So if you have like a... 3D sphere and you cut it in the second dimension, you end up with always a circle, but it may be a different size circle. In the same way, when you cut a gloam into three dimensions, you end up with a sphere that's always a different size sphere. Um, so this is a close up on it. You see some of the electronics on the outside. The plugs all go to the inside and you patch it inside. So the patch is a very important part of our process and of the process we'd like other people to participate in in the participatory work. This was done as a workshop with a bunch of university students from Leeds, and they all got to build one of the modules and plug it. And uh, we all did a collaborative performance with it. This opera hall, you can see sort of one of the video stills that it's making there. Um, this is another installation. This one is not um, interactive or participatory in that way that you can actually contribute to the video or the sound, but it is that in that you can climb through this sort of black hole in the bottom and look up inside and get up inside of that sort of playground netting. So this is about a uh, three and a half meter diameter uh, structure on the bottom, and it's about three and a half meters tall as well. Um, maybe four meters, so 14 feet. And um, so basically <coughs> modeled, it's, it's called inverted H-bar, and it, it refers to sort of theories of the beginning of the universe um, and the sort of early epochs of development of matter, which I'm not gonna go into too much, but we, we didn't want it to be quite so didn't. didactic as that, so we thought the playground netting sort of offset a lot, and we call these 
perspectives on the second level there. We, those are pizzas and things like that, but they're the galaxies and black holes at the bottom. Um, people could go inside and look up into it. This girl is not so tall, but some people's heads are all the way up in there. Um, this is showing one of the video monitors that's embedded in the side of it. This is uh, generating this video and sound all live through a synthesizer that's built in towards the top of it. I have a shot here that will show you some of the modules, how they're suspended kind of in the air. We liked also the playground netting and that it almost has this wireful uh, feel as well. That's why we chose that. So since then, we've been doing these kind of uh, what we call wireful interventions, which are more sort of participatory performances. This is one from PS1. There's also a little dance that goes with it, which is why people's hands are doing this. But basically, the goal here is that they're supposed to hold this wire. It's called Help Carry a Tune. We pass these um, about 30 meter long uh, spools of wire through the audience, and they would unroll it as they passed it around and um, pass it back up to us. We would plug it into the synthesizer. This was a sound only synthesizer um, for this one. And they would, uh, as it would plug in, it would each one would you know develop the patch and contribute to the sound and make it more and more uh, complex. So it started with absolutely no sound. When the first one got plugged in, it was just a solid tone. And then it was kind of a beat with that tone. And then it went and became more and more involved and modulated. This is us plugging it. It's built into this kind of mountain. And there's this hand that all the wires come through and go through. Those other hands on the monitors on the side, that's actually pre-recorded video for this version. We did another version later where it does make video as well. This is them passing it. You can see sort of the wires going through the air and then holding it, which is very important. So this is the next version of that piece. It was called Lighter Than Air, Easier to Carry. Sort of developing from there, you see the change in the color of the mountain. Um, the hand is now actually floating. And this was done at a place called Exit Art. You can see some of the details. It also includes video, and it starts to include some more um, touch-sensitive interactive elements that the other one didn't really have. In, the, in Help Carry a Tune, they were really just holding, physically holding the wire to carry the tune. But um, they weren't actually participating. Their body's electric electrical signals were not participating in the piece. And this one they actually can through these hands that are mounted on the wall that you don't see in that picture. But in this piece, we really started from that point of having uh, interactive and participatory elements. So this makes um, video. There's also this weaving station where people can weave with the wire here. Um, and you can see it's projecting into this corner and the kids are dancing in it. Um, there are these hands. They could do this hand weaving as well as the loom weaving that you see there. Those are all laser cut elements, and they have sort of uh, loose instructions. Um, we're sort of interested in um, work that's we call it participatory performances rather than interactive. Just sort of thinking about how things you can kind of get involved with it, but you're not explicitly controlling it. Um, so. Uh, this is the kind of video that that makes. Here's another shot. Um, these are sort of the instructions you see on the side laser cut, but they're very loose instructions so that you're not, you know, given explicit instructions of what you need to do, but more possibilities. Um, here's uh, showing the interactive elements of it. It has these sort of quarter-inch uh, guitar jacks that you can, uh, you can touch, and um, your body's electricity is then fed into the synthesizer, which is suspended over your head in this space. There's a high ceiling there. So this was at a place called Urbis in Manchester. Um, we had four of these, because the performance part that we did, we did a special performance for this with our daughters. We have two daughters um, who are five and seven, and um, it was all four of us. The performance was called Family Ties, and uh, there was one at each sort of uh, height of, you know, that we could each reach designed for us. And obviously, uh, you know, when it wasn't a performance, other people could touch whichever ones of those they wanted, and they all contributed in various ways your body's electrical signal to the general patch. Um, some other shots of it. This is a piece, I'm probably going to skip through this one. This is just the video synthesizer that makes very slow video because a lot of our video is very fast. It's all self-contained. It's a live video object. The way the others are live video installations. But an important part is the live signal for us and it's always making it live. This one, we were really going for the limits of perception in sort of the under stimulation sense. So normally a lot of our work is very um, overwhelming and you know very kind of loud and noisy and bright and colorful and flickery. And um, this piece is just a very slow fade from red to yellow, and it takes seven weeks to do that. And it's all done in hardware, so it's, you know, the, the process of it was interesting for us. It's painted to reflect that fade from red to yellow from the top to bottom, as video would do. But obviously, when you're watching it, you're not seeing any kind of fade, because it's be, sort of beyond your threshold of actually perceiving change. Called to L red. This is another piece that also deals with perception. It's called Hearing Red. This is a video synthesizer. We made it with a CNC mill, computer-controlled mill. And it has a circuit that we etched onto it that also includes you know, functional elements as well as sort of uh, aesthetic elements, which are modeled after the parts of the inner ear. And um, what this does is it makes red video, just plain red video. 
except for it plays it not through a monitor or a projector or anything, but just through the speaker down there. So you actually see these two elements. This was done for a show, a place called Gigantic Art Space. The show was called Silence, and we were thinking about sort of ideas of what you perceive and don't perceive, because this is actually really making real video, and the um, printing on the fabric is also video still. It's just the way that you know we always print our things to make the object. We print uh, things that it produces. This is basically that as fabric, video fabric that's red, but it's playing just the sound of red. And what that actually is, is because of the way video is constructed, you have one kind of high-pitched sound that's about, because we're using NTSC, it's about 15 kilohertz, um, that's sort of towards the top limit of your hearing, and then one that's at about 60 uh, hertz, which is sort of on the low limit of what you hear as actually a tone. Not quite at the bottom, but it's kind of limits. We were thinking about this quote from John Cage, where he was talking about being in an anechoic chamber, where you get no, no sensory input whatsoever, and you start to hallucinate. Um, so you like float in this thing, I guess everyone knows this. Um, but anyway, um, so you basically, uh, in that he said there are two sounds you hear, a very high-pitched sound and a very low-pitched sound. And the high-pitched one, he said, is your neurons firing, and the low-pitched is your blood flowing. So we were interested in that idea uh, with that. This is just another um, live video object. It's called Retimo. You can see the waterfall elements for it. This is actually making a shin. I'm not going to go into too much detail because I want to save some time for this other thing. But these are just some other shots of it. Uh, this has one monitor embedded and a synthesizer. It's, it's a Jewish ritual object where you wrap one of these around your arm, the one with the, all the electronics, and then one goes around your head. It's, it's, it's called Tefillin. The original object is called Retsuo, which focuses on the straps and refers to our interest in the wires and all those other things. Close up on the electronics. Um, this is just another uh, live video object that's a little bit cut off. I'm not going to go into much details. You can peek through to the uh, electronics that are in this part, like through this hole that you can't really see in this photo. Close up. Um, the, you know, the rest of it is sort of translating this video into the third dimension, just as we've done all the other translation of printing or laser cutting, et cetera, translating the data, the, the information that the synthesizer is producing into another form. And that's it. That's the end of this part. And um, I just thought I would play sort of something very different, um, a web piece. Now, I need, to, I need to do a few things here to get this to happen. So give me a second. If you guys want to ask questions, you can. I won't be able to answer them because I'm doing this. But um, I just need to change the size here. You can also walk out if you want to get time. Um, all right. So no questions? Well, what's the difference between interacting and influencing? So for us, what we like to do is to allow people to contribute to the thing, but not to control it, so that it's really doing whatever it happens to be doing, and it has its own behavior. And that's very important for us in performances as well, that we don't control every element of it. We like this sort of chaos and the sort of randomness. And that's one of the reasons we like to work with analog that I didn't really go into is we sort of like that the randomness is very inherent to the material, and that it's not that you have to put in a random generator or anything, but that it just is inherently unstable and it responds to humidity or temperature or other things in the room. So in that way, we also like the pieces to have a behavior that we can sort of predefine, but to allow people to contribute to it rather than having you know control of it. You know, Sometimes you have a thing like, oh, there's me waving. I see myself waving up there. That's like interactive, but it's... You know, we find it a little bit less stimulating for us. We like a piece that has sort of its own sense of self, and then you can you can you can interact with that in a in a different way than just by controlling. Thank you. All right. Okay, so we're gonna see how this <coughs> works here. It's probably isn't gonna be no, but we'll try. Um, okay. So this is actually like a very different thing than what I was talking about, but it does still deal with. Um, it does still deal with sort of a personal interaction with the technology, which is very important for us and for our process. Um, and that's why we like to, you know, hand solder all our connections. We like to, we often use hand sewing techniques as well as machine sewing for the video fabrics and things like that. Um, we like this sort of, you know, physical connection between the body and the, and the materials. So this is a way we tried to do that with the web piece. Um, it's called More of the Same. And I think it's best if I probably just play it for you and you'll get the sense of what it does. But this was a commission for turbulence. Um, What's up with this computer? Is it the browser? The connection? Okay, so this is just us talking about this computer, right? We have What's up with this computer? Laptop. Is it the browser? The connection? Okay. So then what we do is we just play it twice, right? What's up with this computer? Is it the browser? The connection? 
What's up with this computer? So we've done the same thing, we're just playing it back twice. It's the same file, and the HTML is very simple if anyone wants to geek out later. What's up with this computer? But it's really just like one line of code. Um, and, and these images are just basically cut. It's the same images cut to be a two by two screen, okay? Um, the white at the top is not supposed to be there. That's an unanticipated glitch that just happened over the last week, and I don't know why. Maybe it's a new version of Firefox. What's up with this computer? Is it the browser? Is it the browser? The connection? The connection? Okay, so this is four, yeah? What's up with this computer? This computer. Is it the browser? The browser? The connection? I don't want to waste too much time with the low numbers here. So each one doubles. What's up with this computer? Is it the browser? Is it the browser? The connection? The connection? What's up with this computer? What's up with this computer? So it's still pretty hard. Is it the browser? The connection? The connection? But we'll keep going. What's up with this computer? What's up with this computer? Is it the browser? Is it the browser? The connection? The connection? What's up with this computer? What's this computer? Okay, we'll go on. 32. What's up with this computer? So as the sound is doing, the image is becoming What's less and less. What's up with this computer? 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 I still don't want to waste too much time on 32. <laughs> Questions while it tries to load. If anyone has any questions, otherwise um, later on there's I have I have one of the instruments. I, I can't play it without my wife being here with the other half of it. But um, you can look at it later if you want. We also have I have some postcards if people are interested. I have some DVDs um, of, of sort of some of our old work dealing with the broken sink kind of stuff. I have a power supply if you want to look at how not to design things. I mean probably the whole everything is a good way of not designing things if you need some um, terrible warnings. And uh, I also have this uh, DVD that's uh, from shorting out the graphics card of an old computer. <coughs> I don't know. I don't know if this is going to happen here, really. It's kind of already. I mean, normally that happens at some point, but it's usually kind of, uh, kind of fun. So, does anyone want to ask any questions? Yes. So, what's your motivation? Are you interested in the technology or interested in the art and the, or the interaction part of it? I, I think we start from an interest in sort of aesthetics, and we use technology to achieve our aesthetic goals. I mean, a lot of our interests are in sort of, a lot of our aesthetic interests are in sort of the faults and the fragility of the technology and in problems with it, and in also the physical experience of the technology. But I think it comes more from a sort of theoretical, conceptual aesthetic background than really trying to you know, develop a tool and then use that tool to do some art with. Help me understand this piece that we're still listening okay. to. Yeah, I mean, maybe in, I need to explain In an it. ideal world with an infinitely fast machine, well, I don't know if that's an idea. I mean, that's a we, we have this thing called <laughs> retrofuturism, where we're no, we don't really want technology to be efficient or anything. We like the, um, I was you know, rather in an ontological sense. Okay. I was talking about it in a, in a performative sense. Yes. Okay, so if this computer could I mean, I think go fast enough, we would just hear it once 
in perfect clarity without I, any I guess, echo. I guess theoretically, and, and if there, but I mean, I think there always is going to be at least one command in between each trigger. I don't think there's any way you could possibly, I mean, even if you wrote it in assembly, you still would have, there's still going to be whatever the, the processor speed is, it has to call one thing and then it has to call the next thing. So I think, I don't think that even in the ideal, you could, you, maybe you could make it fast enough that you wouldn't perceive a difference between the first one and the 512 if you're talking on the like picosecond range, if you had command speeds of picoseconds and you, maybe it'd be possible. But I, I mean, for us, obviously that's not a goal I and mean, the piece wouldn't do anything if that were the case. So that's not, you know, what we're more thinking about is sort of the personal nature of the technology and that your computer is going to be different than my computer. I mean, I, I showed this piece in Groningen, and it could play up to 512. It, it had some trouble, and it started crashing, and it usually breaks up much differently than this, but it's, you know, it, it, it is going to break at some point. If it didn't break at 512, I would have kept going. I mean, it's not like I had to stop at 512, because it's very easy to just copy all my code and just paste it in again. And, uh, I mean, it's kind of, you know, gets uncomfortable to look at the HTML when you have so many lines, but... It's really, it was really just copying and pasting the same thing because each time was just twice the previous one. So. And there was no real reason I had to, the only reason I stuck with 512 actually is because that's the number of pixels in the grid, you know. So at that point, the whole image was one pixel by one pixel, so there was no reason to go any further. But I could have, I could have done that differently for the initial image because I down it to make it 512 by 512. So it's different on different computers. Absolutely. And, and this is really different. like, unfortunately, it's usually a lot more kind of broken up and like clicky. I mean, I recommend trying it on a different right. computer just because. And it would be different 10 years from now as the technology. Absolutely. I mean, hopefully it will still be supported. It uses only very basic HTML, nothing fancy. Um, it does have two different calls for the sound files because um, whatever that Microsoft browser is mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't follow everyone else's rules. and it, um, it, it wouldn't play the regular call, but other than that, it's I mean it's it's the most basic HTML you can have, the most basic tags I could I could use. So hopefully it won't go out of date. Although I'm you know obviously with technology that always happens anyway. So. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> I always have to. Uh, I don't like to. <laughs>
Take a short break, um, and then we'll come back with uh, Bert's uh, presentation. So, go get a beer. Yeah. 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 This one, you have to make your own sound for this one. It has no sound on it. It's just from shorting out the graphics card of an old 486 computer. And people are supposed to short out this card or they get widgets to make their sound track. Okay. So we're eventually going to have a part of This is about um, interfaces for expression. Because I find generally technology does not allow us very well to express ourselves. So sort of there's a, a boundary. And um, I just read that Microsoft's going to solve it with games. They're going to get rid of the controller. So read your brain. I don't know. This is the problem, right? That the companies think that they already know what I'm going to do. And if I were that predictable, there wouldn't be any reason for living. Um, so I've, I've sort of made up a little story with my slides, but I think I probably have three stories at the same time. And I uh, haven't been to the hairdresser like Kyle, <laughs> so it'll be it'll be very funny. Um, I'm here for some work at the University of Eindhoven. And so, students are here, um, and we're we're making making things. Hey, um, okay, but well, that's enough about Anchor. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, thank you, TV for um, sponsoring my flight, and thank you, Stan, for hosting me. I I sleep behind that wall. And I, this is very exciting for me. I used to work here 20 years ago, and uh, we used, when there was still room to play ping pong. And um, I never knew there was, a, was something there. But it's, just, <laughs> it's maybe a bit weird. <laughs> anyway, so um, a couple of years ago, I moved to Australia. And for those of you who don't know where Australia is, it appears to be in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> but the scale is so. Any Australians here? Or New Zealand? Because then I can say I traveled first to be here. Um, there's similar uh, amount of people in the whole island. It's just weird. Wherever you go, it's just empty. So next time when Kate Wilders uh, tells you that Holland is full, oh, there was pin, right? Yeah, anyway, yeah. just come to Australia. <laughs> it's good. There's, there's actually one good building there. That's the Opera House. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
this is a fraction of my selection. I have every time I go past in, on the ferry and I go to work, I take a picture. And I think that's not because I like to be a bit anal about it or something, but you see it looks different every time. And I think that's that's nice. A good building would do that. Um, when I got there, I made um, a video piece. And probably I'll explain later why. Um, and this is the card that I made for it, which is out there. And then I animated the card. But if you haven't seen the card, it, this junk really doesn't work. But it works for me. This is the thing, what it looks like. So it's a collage of videos of trains. And I think being a train spotter is something that runs in the family, and we haven't worked out why yet. Um, but when I lived in Europe, I spent a lot of time filming from trains and kept capturing the patterns and the textures almost that I see around me and I was very fascinated by. Uh, with, with the purpose to put them in a collage. And I stopped doing that because they're not such good frames in Australia. Maybe that's why. Um, the audience could influence the delivery of the videos uh, by these proximity sensors. You, see, you could play the, the videos against each other. You could also change different scenes to provide six or seven different uh, groups of videos. The special cards that has an RFID tag. And um, I like this slide. <coughs> it's my dear colleague Charles Fry from Architecture. And he knows I'm showing this slide. One time I showed it when he was in the room. Uh, this, for me, <coughs> is what it's all about. Get people to move. If, if they don't do it, if they don't play with it, I haven't done my job right. Um, so that's sort of part of my research, is to make installations and use these sort of experiments to uh, study how people relate to technology and how to improve that. So I set up a studio at this faculty, and they made me a sort of professor. I gave me some room and some toys to play with, and these lovely people who made a very smooth floor for me. Look how smooth it is. I think they actually licked it for the last lesson. <laughs> And I wanted a smooth floor because I wanted to make something really reconfigurable. I didn't want to fix anything. Maybe that's sort of reflecting on my attitude in life generally. But um, everything on wheels, the only thing that's fixed is a grid with power. And we can drop cables everywhere, uh, put in the wiring as we go along for sensors, for video, data, whatever. Nothing fixed. And cable trace at the top and the bottom. It's sort of similar to what I've done before in Barcelona and in Maastricht, but this time I had more uh, facilities to really develop. Mm -hmm. And um, I have some pictures, I won't bore you too much, but every time you come there it looks different. So it can be turned into a workshop, we can have a lecture like this with an audience and someone talking, um, or we can have a party and everything in between. It tends to get messy, which is good, of course. It was a tinker workshop. This is an introduction to sensors and interactivity for students to learn. Like, so they bring their own video. I'm not responsible for what you see there. And then they work on mapping sensor input to video data. And I think that's one of the most important things in design in this field, is the mapping between input and output. And the more freedom you have to do that, the better the chance that you do something interesting with it. Uh, someone who doesn't need any le lessons is Robin Fox from Melbourne. He makes, maybe some of you heard of him. If you haven't, check him out. This guy is radical. He used to use an oscilloscope to visualize his sounds. So I would make this sound so that it would make interesting uh, patterns on the oscilloscope. That may sound a bit geeky, but it's actually very cool. But it was hard to blow up and to present to an audience, so I made a laser version of it. Same principle, moving the laser <coughs> with a mirror. But it sounded like. So the sounds you hear are the sounds you see. It's very direct 
translation. And generally in art, direct translations are boring and don't work. But with him, it does. And he spends a long time tuning this. This was before my studio opened, and the space was empty. And um, <coughs> he put a lot of smoke in it and his lasers. And that was part of the symposium we had on sound and music and design relationship. And of course, when you put my uh, fill my studio with smoke and, or fog, then I go in there with my projectors and have some fun. It's pretty amazing what you can do. It's, it's better in the real because you see 3D. James Cameron will probably pick this up soon. And this is my studio uh, at the opening in um, uh, mid 2008. And bigger version of the installation that you see out, out there. And I had projections everywhere just to lighten up. This faculty previously didn't do very much with video or interactivity or sound. And it was my crusade to change that. But we didn't quite well, actually. So this was a starting point. And this is the team at the moment, mainly PhD researchers. And lots of postgraduate students come in, undergraduate students, colleagues. And we all play in my, in my playground there. Um, but how did I get there? I think I got there because of this. I was a student intern in 1986 and built some <coughs> extra switches on Michel Weiss's hands. Because that was the time when he was still extending. So, Look, my thumb can <coughs> up as well. Let's put a switch there. But soon after he stopped doing that, we rebuilt the, the instrument a couple of times, but never changed the, the functions of it, which I think is a very important message. <coughs> so here you have. Um, um, Michelle plays the last part that Jorgen made. This is the version 2. And this is a, a, a classical version for the uh, music of Schoen and Basel. And you will miss Michelle. He put me on this track of making really sensitive impacts. And that's what I'm trying to translate in my current work. Um, this was a good example of an instrument that was meant to be really, really sensitive with many parameters at the same time. So you grab in the middle, and the tensions are then trying to be sensitive to develop <coughs> and translate it into musical parameters or anything. For another one, this was the prototype of the MIDI conductor. This was and to be the um, sort of general purpose version of the hands. And this was the first version that was made. <coughs> um, but of course, lots of gloves. The, the glove was the Fender uh, Stratocaster of the early 90s. <coughs> so, uh, Walter Fabek from London, uh, Florence Hand, Bottom Back, that just dreams. He wants the very simple instrument. Uh, Latisha Tsunami. Carlos van Durpen, the web, Thomas van Inter. sensitive, you have to get that close to the skin and custom build for the person. 
Another track at the time was people who would extend the instrument by electronics. So John Knin has sensors that move uh, with pistons, with red pressure, and 3D uh, location in space. And Francis Maria Wiki had an extended. There was the cello plus plus. Okay. Or uh, good old sensor band made the sound band in 1996, I think. Um, which was a nice move away from that fine and fiddly stuff of the gloves and the hands and make something room size and climb into it and make music. Or later with uh, Atar Zanarka and Kasper Tuklitz, we made a global string, which um, are two physical strings of 10 meters long at two different locations in the world. This was in Linz, and the other uh, part of the string was in Rotterdam for that, that festival. And two players playing through the internet with each other. So that's nice that you have a physical uh, instrument and a, and a lot of <coughs> effort going into that instrument, playing it, and um, using the internet in between as sort of a sounding body. So the way that data packages travel up over the internet was uh, of influence on the sound. It also had um, actuators, you know, sensors are for it, it's actuators. And thank you, Kathy, for showing that, uh, that word. This is something similar, this is um, electromagnet that can be electronically controlled and moving the string. And that was controlled by the... Uh, anyway, um, it was controlled by the other player. So if one player hits the string in Rotterdam, in Austria you would hold that string and feel that impulse. So remote touch. I think we all need that now. So this is what I found um, much later, uh, really as part of my PhD, uh, looking at what was I doing at that time. I was just making instruments and much later I reflected on it and I realized that it put me on a certain track, a certain approach to uh, designing of interfaces. And um, still musical instruments are the best example of this uh, rich and precise control notion of effort that goes into it, that you have to build into the electronic instrument. It doesn't come with it, like with a mechanical system. But then, of course, you go to the shop, and there's <laughs> 30 euro bucks. Yeah. I nearly bought it. I also nearly bought the, the rhythm stick. Hit me with you. <coughs> That was really hard work in the 90s to make these things, and now you buy them in the toy store. But of course, these, all these things, they just trigger that lesson of having continuous control and when you're nervous that you hear that in the sound, all that sort of crap, is not in here. So, or in this one. So this is a, um, a remake of an analog instrument, and it looks a bit like the Crackle box. But again, this is the remake, it's samples, it's, it's triggers, whereas this is still the analog thing that we want until the Rutgers is found out. Well, I could say something about that there's no point in becoming famous anymore because. You have the euro now, so you won't get <laughs> I think Adolf Sachs is a bit of my hero. <coughs> if I can only find out who his hairdresser was, it will be okay. Um, but anyway, the point is that he's designing an instrument that is still being used by musicians who make the kind of music that he could never have envisioned. So he didn't put any assumptions or, or uh, limitations in the instrument that would prohibit people to make their own music with. <coughs> so from that experience, um, well, among other things, 
serious research stuff and um, this sort of things. Um, started to perform with a video, audiovisual instrument together with Melanie Harris. And um, because I wanted to know what it was like to build an instrument and perform with it yourself. So this is me doing uh, scientific research. I'm going onto stage and play and want to control the whole loop. This is what the instrument looked like, like a mess, you might say. Clean up a bit. Um, what I did was rather than starting with an instrument shape beforehand and then building it, um, I started from the functions of the system. So we had um, one object for every function. <coughs> and this is a radical break with the normal computer interface, which has one interface for everything. And if you think about it, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, this is a bit more work, of course, to say, but it's a great freedom to play with. You would have a table full of these instrumentlets, as we call them. Just pick them up and play. And um, one time Michelle said that it looked like we were uh, in the kitchen having an argument. I uh, also started to experiment with projections on non-flat surfaces. This is boring. Um, and taking this notion of, of using the projection to, um, to, to let the building speak. So with this installation we were performing inside, projecting outwards with not only video, but also a low-tech um, slide, slide projectors controlled by work researchers without any computer in between. That's quite a refreshing case in each of this. Um, and here's another question of that one. It's drift on the river with the mass. So taking the boats out of the river and moving them out. Since 2000, as a European project, we set up a, um, a, sort of a, a group with the Meta Orchestra. We called it Meta because it was uh, multidisciplinary. That was the first thing. And the second reason was that everyone, uh, once set up, was linked in a fast network. So we could influence each other's instruments. <coughs> and not everyone, not everyone likes that, but these people do. Like John Finis, but they start doing all playing extended instruments, which then can be networked. There's video and dance and all sorts of things in there. And I've got some really bad pictures. I'm sorry about that. But this is a nice picture, I think, but it doesn't tell you anything. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a long way down. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is um, a disused uh, vine in near Genk. Need to provide it again. And these buildings were derelict, but one of them was at least had windows in. So we were invited to do a performance in there. Uh, Michelle Vasius was part of that as well. Fantastic spaces. <coughs> us working away. Made a very nice projection on the gauze. And gauze is nice because you like that you project onto the gauze goes through and creates another effect behind it. And of course, there had to be trains. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing that um, in playing with this. <laughs> well, that was the first test, but I always thought with the Yamaha disc here, the only thing you should be doing with it, with it is playing it through sensors. So we made a setup. And um, had the audience play. And during the performance, literally taking the piano apart and added various ways of changing the sound. Uh, this is a way of playing prepared piano vertically. Uh, if you ever feel the need to do that, a bit of John Cage at home, then use magnets. Um, and an evo to make the string um, 
vibrate until the battery runs out, which is a lot longer than the <coughs> disc appear allows you to hold the note down, because that's 12 seconds, and we needed longer notes than that. Um, we also had a, an audio feedback system in building and an electronic feedback system. Now from there, I'm jumping.